All right, welcome to Insects and Diseases. Uh, we have Peter Gogg here from the Forest North Dakota Forest Service. He is the Forest Health Manager. And I'm gonna read a little description about him and then I'm gonna start a video that he pre-recorded and then Peter is gonna be available for questions afterwards. Peter is originally from Minnesota. He received an undergraduate degree in natural resources and environmental studies from the University of Minnesota after completing his undergraduate degree. He worked as a fisheries technician at the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness for the Minnesota DNR. Peter spent two years in the remote tundra of Alaska teaching school and the next 17 years living and working in the Mountain West. Returning to school in 2004, Peter earned his um, master's degree in forest resource at the University of Idaho. Following this, he worked with the United States Forest Service as a biological te technician and research scientist focusing on invasive species and the ecological impacts of fire and forest practices. In the spring of 2013, Peter's family moved to Taylor Wilderness Research Station located in the heart of Frank Church uh, River, River of No Return Wilderness of North Dakota. The Very large long bio, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the largest forested wilderness in the lower 48 states. Uh, at the Taylor Wilderness Research Station, he managed all aspects of the facility, taught field ecology, and guided graduate and undergraduate researchers. Peter has spent much of the last seven years exploring the wilderness alone and guiding ecologically focused students back in backpacking trips. Peter is now the forest health manager of the North for the North Dakota Forest Service, where he is excited to contribute to protecting the state's forest resources. I'm assuming we have far fewer forests here than uh, the last place that you lived, Peter. <laughs> yeah, we do, sorry, that was so long. It was built for, uh, for put together for an entomology class that I presented to, so. <laughs> okay, I will share Peter's video now. Hello, my name is Peter Gogg, and I'm the Forest Health Manager for the North Dakota Forest Service. The following is a presentation about North Dakota's trees and some of the common insects and diseases that ail them. Learning to evaluate diseases and pests in North Dakota goes beyond just looking at the trees. We need to understand something about the different categories of forests, whether or not they're natural, or planted trees, some of the climatic relationships, and once we can get a handle on those issues, we can start to evaluate abiotic injuries, common diseases, and then the common insect pests. The last piece of this presentation, I want to talk about the sick tree assistance form, which will be a method for you to be able to record information and get additional assistance if needed. So what are the categories of forests in North Dakota? We've generally broken these into three groups, native forests, community forests, and conservation plantings. Now North Dakota is particularly interesting because it's ecologically characterized as prairie, which means that less than 2% of the land area is actually covered by trees. The first and largest category is the native forests, which make up approximately 815,000 acres comprised of upland and riparian zones. The riparian forests are found along our waterways and consists of deciduous species such as cottonwood, ash, and elm. 
we have both a deciduous and coniferous upland forest component. The deciduous forest is primarily the aspen birch forest of the Turtle Mountains, the bur oak forest around Devil's Lake, and the coniferous forests of the southwest corner of the state, with isolated stands of juniper and ponderosa and limber pine. The second largest forest category is community forest. These are the forests that surround our lives, lining our streets and parks. They can be found growing naturally or planted on both private and public lands. This forest category can have a broad range of species, but is often dominated by green ash, elm, hackberry, linden, and maples. This list of species continues to grow as we diversify our community forest to limit the loss from pests and diseases like we've seen with Dutch elm disease and potentially emerald ash borer. The third forest category is conservation plantings, which play a particularly interesting role in North Dakota. Simply put, they make life on the plains a bit easier. With thousands of miles of farmstead plantings, windbreaks, or living fences, conservation plantings create a unique scenario where trees are planted where they frequently never existed naturally. So how are trees planted on the prairie influenced by the conditions that define North Dakota's temperate grassland biome? This isn't to say there has never been trees in this landscape. This only means that the continental interior climate and the development of the associated grasses has created soils that are unlike those found in forested landscapes. North Dakota's historic conditions have generally led to the development of fine textured mineral soils, rich in organic matter, high in pH, and often saline. Frequently having pH levels higher than 7 exceeds the conditions that most trees have evolved with, making the availability of micronutrients difficult for these species to acquire. Also in many areas of the state, fine textured loam or silk clay soils with a high degree of capillary flow can have transient salts in the soil profile, which can move into the rooting zone, limiting water availability to plants. Another important variable is limited available moisture. North Dakota's annual precipitation falls mostly during the growing season and is less than would commonly be found in most forested landscapes. For this reason, trees planted in much of North Dakota are at a competitive disadvantage to grasses, which have a higher level of water use efficiency. Trees that are planted in North Dakota are tested and have been demonstrated to grow across much of the landscape. Many of these trees, not having evolved here naturally, are considered off-site plantings. As was previously mentioned, these plantings have a series of challenges that can be posed by particular conditions of the site. The next important consideration is how well are they planted. You can imagine a seed growing naturally in the soil will distribute its root system to best acquire the resources it needs. Growing and planting a seedling poses many introduced issues that can complicate growth efficiency. In most cases, planting well-developed seedlings has been recognized as producing a structurally superior root system. But if we are not careful when planting, that initial advantage can be lost. Planting carefully needs to consider variables such as depth, imprinted circling roots from containers, and J-rooting of seedlings. All of these variables may introduce added difficulty to root systems that have future consequences to the health of the tree. Now that we understand how potential site conditions and planting off-site can challenge tree health, we should consider what is and has been occurring with weather. The occurrence of insects and diseases are the outcome of an accumulation of variables that challenge tree vigor. The timing of precipitation and temperature events with respect to the growing season often become the decisive variable or stressor that reduces vigor enough to create the susceptibility of trees to the secondary issues of insects and disease. As we have seen with many of the highly variable weather events recently, how and when these events occur has important implications for trees. Receiving late season fall rains can prevent trees from preparing for winter dormancy Moist, warm spring conditions can promote fungal growth. 
Heavy rainfall events can create topographically defined moisture conditions that essentially drown trees. And wind and storm events can damage trees, introducing physical injury that can reduce vigor mechanically or create vectors for disease. Now we can start considering all the variables we have been addressing and think about how they are influencing tree health. The decline recovery seesaw was introduced by White et al. in 2016 as a way of thinking about tree health with respect to drought. Drought stress, or specifically moisture stress, which can range from saturated to beyond wilting point, will drive tree pest pathogen interactions. Drought still needs to be considered in relation to offsite planting and site conditions, but generally moisture stress can be the variable that pushes a tree in one direction or the other on this spectrum. The amount and timing of precipitation events has recently been an overarching variable to pay attention to, since we have seen extensive swings of winter snowfall and large variations in growing season rainfall. Too much or too little moisture during the growing season can cause stress and loss of vigor. Over the past few years, it has become normal to see growing season drought in western North Dakota. Drought occurs outside of our control depending on where a tree may be growing. We can obviously encourage some level of watering in locations where it is a possibility. Trees control stomatal conductance, or the loss of water through the leaf surface, to limit drought stress. By doing so, they reduce photosynthetic efficiency, influencing growth, but allowing the tree to recover should soil moisture recover. During periods of extended growing season drought, leaf area can be reduced and resources can become limited for growth. This is often the first driver that reduces the vigor of a tree and opens the door for secondary infection, which can be foliar pests or diseases. As this process continues and stress occurs again through the same or another variable, we may see the introduction of a boring insect or an increase in pathogens. Either way, as these stressors accumulate, tree health and growth decline. Following on the concept of the decline recovery seesaw, as drought induces some level of stress and a related loss of vigor, the door is initially opened to foliar insect pests and latent pathogens. Now, latent pathogens are organisms like fungi that may be present on a tree and can produce disease. Diseases will be addressed later in this presentation. For now, we'll focus on some of the commonly seen insect issues, which can be categorized into two distinct groups, the foliar insects and wood boring insects. Foliar insects often come along when trees are mildly stressed, and they usually cause little health issue for trees. For this presentation, foliar insects are those that defoliate, produce galls, or are sap suckers. The second major category of insect pests are the borers, which can be further divided into bark beetle and wood boring beetles. There are many more foliar and wood boring insects, but we will focus on those that are likely to be found in North Dakota. We will also look mostly at the damage these insects cause, since that is usually all you will see or find. The first of the foliar insect groups we will cover are the gall producers. Galls are deformations of the meristematic tissues caused by the secretions from the feeding and egg-laying activities of various insects and mites. Meristematic tissues are those that are growing and producing the current year leaves and stems. Pictured here is a hackberry nipple gall produced by a tiny plant feeding insect called a psyllid, which is small enough to slip through a window screen. Remembering that galls are rarely a major concern for tree health, they can reduce the photosynthetic efficiency when on leaves in great numbers, but this is rarely an issue. Here are some of the galls that are relatively common. Aerophyid mites, which are a tiny herbivorous insect, cause several types of galls primarily on maple, birch, and linden. Oaks have many gall producers associated with them. In North Dakota, it is common to find bullet galls on bur oak which are produced by a cynipid gall wasp. The wasp larvae develop and emerge from these galls as adults. The woolly oak leaf gall is formed on the midrib of oak, also by a tiny gall wasp.
The next foliar insect group is the scale producers. Scales are hard or soft coverings protecting the sap feeding insect that is hidden beneath them. Scales can be found on the stem, twig, foliage, or fruit of a tree and vary in size, color, and hardness. In most circumstances, they are a cosmetic problem, but can injure a tree in large numbers and repeated seasonal presence. The insects that form scales have sucking, piercing mouth parts and remove sap from the outer tissues of the tree. Soft scales feed on foliar surfaces and produce honeydew, which is the undigested sugar and water solution that creates a shiny surface on leaves and stems and attracts other predators and can cause a sooty black mold. Hard scales are smaller and feed on individual plant cells, often on woody structures. Aphids are the most common plant pests and can be found on all types of plants. There are more than 360 known species in the United States. Like soft scales, aphids feed on the sap within the foliage, which leads to them excreting honeydew, making the surface of the tree and the ground below shiny and often sticky. Aphids rarely cause damage that is concerning to the health of a tree and can be found associated with virtually any plant. Usually a homeowner will request assistance regarding aphids because they have become numerous enough to influence their daily life or the use of a space around the infected tree or trees. In order to reduce the infestation, high pressure water can be used to spray them off a tree. If they are persistent, becoming an annual problem on a particular tree or shrub, horticultural oils can be applied to the overwintering aphids in the spring before bud break. There are more aggressive chemical applications that can be done, but it is often better to start small. The next group of foliar insects are the defoliators. There are several species of defoliators that are commonly seen in North Dakota throughout the season. Defoliators are an issue for all vegetation because they remove the leaf surface, causing a decrease in photosynthetic tissues that are vital for plant maintenance and growth. Deciduous trees can more readily tolerate repeated annual defoliations because they retain resources within the woody tissues of the tree. Often, deciduous species can produce a second flush of foliage following an early season defoliation event. Consideration should be given to young deciduous trees since they are more vulnerable as they are often still becoming established in their growing space. Conifers, on the other hand, have less of a reserve and retain needles as a way of being ready to produce photosynthetically as the environmental conditions permit. If conifers lose a season's worth of needles, they have less of a capacity to respond to seasonal growing conditions. We will not spend more time on conifer insect defoliators since this is not a common issue in North Dakota. Cankerworms are a small caterpillar that feed primarily on the leaves and buds of elm, hackberry, and apple, and to a lesser extent on the other native deciduous species. Present annually in North Dakota, cankerworm populations vary, with large outbreaks occurring regionally and lasting in the neighborhood of three years. There are two similar looking species with different life cycles that can be found feeding together in the spring. Spring and fall cankerworms are named for the period of time that they emerge as adults. Both species use silken threads to descend from the tree when larvae mature, usually in July. Fall cankerworms will emerge from cocoons in the soil during September and October to mate. The mated females then climb the tree trunks and lay eggs in the tree crown. Fall cankerworm eggs hatch approximately the time when elm buds break in the spring. Spring cankerworms winter in the soil as larvae, emerging as adults in the spring. Mated females climb the trunk and lay eggs in the bark crevices that will hatch in early May. Seeing defoliation in deciduous crowns in June through July may be cankerworms. Look for the green larval inchworm, like we think of inchworms. Cankerworms can be treated by insecticide foliar sprays, but must be caught early in their life cycle, which is not the usual point at which they are noticed to be causing defoliation. Tent caterpillars are another common defoliator that can be found in North Dakota's deciduous trees. There are two species, the eastern tent caterpillar, 
which has a preference for fruit trees, and the forest tent caterpillar, which can be found on essentially any deciduous tree. The forest tent caterpillar is the most prolific of the two species, becoming a nuisance when outbreaks occur, coating most surfaces with their presence. Larvae hatch in the spring and proceed to develop as they feed until mid-June, when they will produce silken cocoons to pupate into the mature moth stage. Generally, these caterpillars do not produce enough damage to kill a tree, but successive seasons of defoliation, like all defoliation, will eventually cause a significant loss of vigor. Tent caterpillars also tend to be cyclic in their population numbers, with a varied time frame from the max to minimum number. In Minnesota, the cycle has been observed to be approximately 12 to 15 years. Generally, species do not need to be controlled, but insecticides are available to be used in particular cases. Fall webworm is one of the web nest producing caterpillars that defoliates deciduous trees and shrubs. The nests are formed on the ends of branches rather than at the forks like the eastern tent caterpillar. Fall webworm is also considered a skeletonizer, eating the fleshy parts of the leaf and leaving behind the midrib and most of the smaller veins of the leaf. Again, most of the damage caused by defoliating worms is aesthetic and shouldn't cause great concern unless the tree has experienced repeated annual attacks or is young and not well established in its growing space. Control of the species can be done by physically removing the nests or pruning out the branches that nests are established on. The next category of insect pests of trees are the wood boring insects. We can think of these insects as wood borers and bark beetles, a group of tree pests that tend to establish after the trees have reached a relatively high level of stress and loss of vigor. The majority of these insects either bore into the heartwood of a tree or tunnel within the cambium layer under the bark, disrupting water and nutrient flow to the tree above and below the damage. In many cases, several species of these two types of wood borers can become established in the same tree, causing it to decline more rapidly. There isn't a clean difference in the labeling of these species, since some species commonly labeled as borers have life histories that are similar to the bark beetles, with larval stages that are spent in the cambium. Now, if we revisit the idea of the decline recovery seesaw, bark beetles attack the weakened, declining, or dead host trees that are experiencing a moderate or greater level of drought stress. It should be considered that this is not always the case. Introduced species like two of the three elm beetles and the emerald ash borer did not evolve with the tree species native to the United States and therefore can attack healthy trees. In a general sense, most of the insect damage that is seen is caused by native insects and drought is frequently driving the reduced vigor that is leading to an attack. Bark beetles attack stress trees, boring under the bark to lay eggs where the larvae will hatch and consume the sugar-rich phloem and sometimes also the outermost layer of the xylem, which is the water transport tissue. There are a few particular beetles that are relatively common to find in North Dakota. Three of these species are vectors of Dutch elm disease, the native elm bark beetle, the smaller introduced European elm bark beetle, and the banded elm bark beetle. Dutch elm disease does not need the beetles to be transmitted since it can be spread by root grafts, but it does need the beetle to spread distances beyond overlapping root systems. All three beetles have similar galleries with a short vertical egg chamber and outreaching larval chambers which become visible well after tree death when the bark falls off. The chamber looks like a strange, long-legged spider-like millipede, petroglyphed, shallowly etched in the outermost layer of the xylem. Elm bark beetles and Dutch elm disease will be the only insect and disease system that will be mentioned in this presentation. The damage associated with these two often presents itself as a thinning crown or flagging, which is dehydrated leaves on the branch or several branches. This is similar damage that could be expected for verticillium wilt, a fungus caused infection within the xylem. Much like the severing of the conductive tissues caused by the elm bark beetles, verticillium also severs the conducting tissues by clogging them with fungal growth. 
This particular circumstance is likely not Verticillium wilt, since there is a borehole present in the bark slightly below the damaged foliage. The non-native elm beetles tend to infest declining or young trees, which may demonstrate that this tree is either not well established in its site or may be stressed by lawn chemicals or mowing behaviors. Another common insect pest in North Dakota is the ash bark beetle, which can be found in mature ash trees within all forest types. It is common to investigate trees that may have been reported as potential emerald ash borer infestations, only to learn that the tree with dead branches in the crown is actually stressed by several variables and is now infested with ash bark beetle. It is a good idea to remove these trees to prevent increasing the presence of the ash bark beetle population in places where neighboring ash may also be susceptible. On the same note, this beetle is becoming our natural disturbance mechanisms in natural ash forests that no longer experience the historical disturbance regime which was most commonly periodic flooding and fire. We will now briefly discuss some of the insects commonly thought of as wood borers. Our interpretation of wood borer is often confused by the commonly used names of many pests, but there are a couple criteria that can be used to separate them from bark beetles. Wood borers are generally those insects that live under the bark and inside the wood of trees. Their tunneling activity is some of the process that helps to decompose a dying tree. Another variable that is common to wood borers is that the adults lay eggs somewhere on the bark surface where eggs are safe and can hatch, allowing the larvae to bore into the tree where they will develop and emerge as adults. The bronze birch borer is a native beetle that lays its eggs in rough locations on the bark of most birch species. The eggs hatch and bore into the cambium, where they will tunnel and develop for a couple of growing seasons, all the while girdling the tree. Birch do not perform well in most of North Dakota due to the higher pH and limited availability of moisture common to the North Dakota climate. These conditions make birch vulnerable to bronze birch borer and another insect, the birch leaf miner. If site characteristics can be managed by choosing the appropriate soil conditions and making water available, then it may be possible to prevent the loss of vigor and the attack of bronze birch borer. Damage caused by the birch borer will be thinning of the crown and chlorotic conditions of the foliage. And it's important to remember that these conditions are very likely preceded by abiotic stresses, such as iron chlorosis and water stress. Carpent worms are truly a heartwood borer, tunneling through the wood of the tree creating a labyrinth of pencil-sized tunnels. These insects are most commonly found in trees exhibiting a moderate or greater level of stress. They tend not to disrupt water or nutrient flow since they bore into the heartwood of the tree as small larvae and then tunnel around as they develop for a few growing seasons before exiting through an emergence hole. The main issue with this borer is that the tunneling within the heartwood significantly reduces the structural integrity of the stem, often leading to wind breakage. Trees that are found to have extensive damage are at a risk of wind throw. Early detection of trees with infestations can be treated with insecticides to prevent further damage, but detecting boring presence and the timing of treatment can be difficult. Zimmerman pine moths are hosted by pine species, which have commonly been used for conservation plantings in community forests in North Dakota. Ponderosa, Austrian, and Scotch pine established in off-site plantings can be found to have Zimmerman pine moth. The adult moths emerge from the bark during the mid-growing season. They mate and then lay eggs near earlier wound sites. The caterpillar hatches after several days feeding on the tree before creating a small pit covered by a cocoon to hibernate through the winter. Hatching in early spring, the larvae then tunnel into the branch tips and shoots, eventually boring into the bark openings or an injury near branch junctions with the main stem. A pitch mass will form at the site of the borehole and tunneling under the bark will produce a structurally weak void that eventually causes breakage. Zimmerman pine moths need a weakened host, which in North Dakota can frequently be found in off-site plantings. 
Trees can be treated with a permethrin drench to the bark when eggs are hatching or recently hatched, but it is difficult to detect their presence at this stage unless the tree is experiencing repeated attacks. Now let's talk briefly about some common disease issues that arise in North Dakota. It's important to understand that latent pathogens give rise to disease that exists wherever trees exist. When the additive stresses of the environment, the site, and off-site planting combine, diseases become a mechanism for generating disturbance within crowns and canopies. Many foliar diseases benefit from cool, wet weather as humid conditions frequently encourage fungal sporulation, leading to the distribution of the associated disease. If the trees are already experiencing a series of site-related stresses, they become vulnerable to periods of time between moderate drought stress and recovery from that stress following precipitation events. Generally, drought will reduce foliar disease incidence, so the effects of the disease are reduced, but the added drought stress further limits foliar effectiveness, which makes periods of atmospheric moisture influential to advancing disease abundance. In North Dakota, there are an assortment of issues that plague spruce, which are not a native tree species. We'll take a brief look at two species that cause needle casts, and another that kills limbs by girdling. Both needle casts are caused by fungal spores that develop in the stomates on the underside of the needles. These fungi are promoted by moist conditions. When stomata remain open and water is not evaporating through the opening because of high humidity, this allows the fungus to become established within the needle, decreasing its effectiveness until it causes needle death. Stigmina is one of the needle cast diseases. It generates a fuzzy spore producing structure that is visible in the stomatal opening if viewed with a hand lens. These structures are a diagnostic indicator since the other needle cast disease, Rhizosphera, has spore producing structures with a smooth rather than fuzzy margin. Because these diseases favor moist conditions, they develop on the protected lower limbs of the crown. The lower inner portions of the crown are less exposed, limiting air circulation and sun exposure, allowing these areas to more frequently remain wet. Both of these diseases cause a loss of older needles, which reduces vigor over time and will kill the tree, as there is eventually no foliage left. Valsa kunzi is a fungus that enters through wounds or openings in the bark, producing a lesion that prevents water and carbohydrate transport. The canker eventually encircles the stem and girdles the branch, causing death of that branch. This canker disease usually occurs on an individual branch and can be spread to other wounded branches. All three of these diseases can be treated with pruning to remove the infection, but should be done carefully. For the needle casts, Pruning can also focus on opening those parts of the crown for better circulation and exposure. Now let's talk about fire blight, which is a bacterial infection that can be found on many species of tree that produce fruit, like apples, crabapple, mountain ash, and others. A canker forms on the stem, girdling it and causing the stem to darken and the leaves to die. The dead stem and leaves droop towards the ground, causing a distinguishable shepherd's crook appearance. The blackened stem and dead orange leaves are a common indicator of fire blight. These damaged limbs should be carefully pruned out to prevent further spread of this problem. Pruning about 12 inches back from the canker into the healthy stem during the winter can help to alleviate fire blight. Pruning tools should be cleaned between every cut to prevent reintroducing the disease to other trees or parts of a tree. So far we have talked about biological agents such as insects and disease that cause health issues with trees. Now let's take a quick look at some of the other biological agents that cause damage. A common finding on many trees in our landscape is a series of holes in the bark of a variety of trees used by avian predators to forage insects and encourage the flow of sap. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers commonly create these wells that they will revisit in order to obtain the sugary sap that is produced to heal the wound. 
This damage will interrupt water and carbohydrate flow when severe enough, potentially girdling a tree or branch. A couple other animal agents are beavers, which cause damage or death by felling, and the sometimes less obvious damage caused by male deer rubbing the lower trunk of the saplings, which causes damage that can resemble sun scalding. Damage caused by porcupine can occur almost anywhere on a tree, since they happily climb. Chewing the bark and cambium eliminates water and carbohydrate flow, which will kill portions of the tree above the wound. In many cases, the damage will girdle the stem, killing the entire tree or segment of the tree. Woodpecker damage can be found in any location on a tree where these predators are probing for boring insects and excavating them when they are found. This damage is called blonding and can occur to a varied extent on a tree. The important thing to recognize with woodpecker damage is that they are actually helping to control the boring insects that are infesting a tree, unlike the porcupine, which has a much less obvious beneficial intent. These are just a few of the examples where animals may be causing the damage that can be seen. There are many other less frequently noticed issues as well. The last component of this presentation is about the abiotic or non-biological variables that influence trees or stands of trees. We have talked about how abiotic issues such as soil conditions and weather-driven occurrences such as precipitation, temperature, or wind can influence trees. Now we need to take a look at how human behavior can influence tree health. The majority of assistance requests regarding ailing tree issues revolve around human-induced abiotic issues. In virtually every setting, there are some human-derived activities that are influencing tree health. We are always doing something that is inadvertently changing the site conditions for a tree, and those activities are the easiest things to focus on in order to improve the situation. Conservation plantings are evolving to consider planting densities that will require little tending as trees grow. Older plantings were done at densities that were derived from plantation forestry, which is focused on maximizing growth through competition. The fundamental principle surrounding these densities was tending, or the intermediate activities that were intended to reduce competition and increase growing space by thinning. We therefore often find many older conservation plantings are planted at far too high a density to reduce competition for space and resources between trees. As a consequence, it is common to find trees in poor health because they are simply too densely planted for their size. Another common finding is that we choose poor sites that may get far too warm during the summer months or too cold and exposed during the winter. Choosing a poor site is usually associated with the species planted, where another species may have done much better but can frequently be associated with what we are placing around that tree. Every time you go to a site, you should be thinking about what is going on around the tree. One of the greatest challenges for a tree is that we tend to plant them in the middle of a well-groomed green lawn. This creates a competitive situation between the grass and trees, which is often compounded by the use of herbicides to rid the grass of broadleaf species and fertilizer, to increase the productivity of the grass. These additions can be difficult for the tree since trees can frequently get what they need from the soil and herbicide will injure foliage through overspray or systemically. Additionally, it is not uncommon to find that a tree has dealt with an injury to the root system from new construction, utility work, or simply damage from implements. Another issue that consistently arises is damage near the root collar of trees planted in a groomed lawn. Repeatedly injuring the bark with the mower deck can eventually cause conductance issues at the root collar. The bark often gets crushed and torn with repeated bumping or string trimming damage. The best method to resolve this issue is to cut out the grass to a reasonable radius, which may be two feet for saplings and longer for larger diameter trees, and replace it with mulch. Mulch holds moisture and reduces the competition from grass, all while helping prevent further damage to the stem. 
The last item that we will talk about is the use of weed fabric for assisting in the establishment of conservation plantings. Quite frequently you can find in older plantings that the opening that was cut for the seedling when it was planted is no longer large enough and has started to girdle the tree. People should be reminded to follow up and cut all of those openings larger to prevent this occurrence. One more issue that raises concern each fall is annual needle drop, which is a normal process for conifers. As needles age and become shaded out by more recent years of needle growth, they become less efficient and are shed to limit the use of resources for maintenance. The number of years of needles on a tree ranges by species, but it is reasonable to find two to four years for scotch pine, three to seven years for most other pine, and five to ten for spruce species. Needle retention is usually longer in colder climates, but it is also significantly influenced by site growing conditions and stress. We have concluded a list of the most common ailments and issues that arise in North Dakota's trees. I now wanted to take a moment to mention the campaign to educate about not moving firewood. Moving raw wood products runs the risk of assisting the migration of all sorts of tree insects and diseases, native or not. Don'tmovefirewood.org has resources to help guide people in this process. This concludes my presentation. I wanted to leave you with two methods of accessing the Sick Tree Assistance Form that can be filled out online using either your computer, as you field calls in the office, or your mobile device in the field. This form is produced using Survey123, so it is sending spatial and tree-related diagnostic information to ArcGIS Online, where I can access it. We will use this information to assist people with issues and record data about what is happening, where, and when. It can be used for assistance, or it can simply be used to record the data if no assistance is required. There is a question built into the form that lets me know whether or not assistance has been requested. This form is available to you and to the public to help more carefully address forest health issues throughout the state. Please visit ndinvasives.org to access the form. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, we will open it up to questions. I think I saw a couple that came through already. I can back up through the list. There was one from Ryan about DED, so Dutch elm disease and whether or not when it's too late. And essentially, DED is, can you guys hear me? <laughs> it's systemic. So once it's in a tree, it's really a, a risk to it and the rest of its neighboring elm. So um, yeah, it's kind of too late once you're observing what you're seeing or observing any damage from DED. Oh, should I continue on? There was another one about tool cleaning. Um, or was that? So what I had been looking at and I thought what made the most sense is you can use lots of, well, you can use isopropyl alcohol and wipe down the tool, but that seems very slow and high maintenance to me. Um, I think an easier thing to do is a 10% solution of bleach. And then you can use a container that's big enough to deal with whatever tool it is you're using and, and dip it. And that should be sufficient as long as you're making sure that it's getting all over the cutting blade. Uh, let's see, porcupines. There was a porcupine question. Um, porcupines are actually a lot like the sap sucker. They're after that cambium. It's, it's yummy and I don't think they have any preference for uh, any particular species. I think most, most often you're going to find porcupines where there's a lack of predators of them, which is most places. So where there's porcupines, there's girdling potential on trees. Um, so trees and anywhere you find trees and porcupines. <laughs> Hopefully that's clear enough. Now that was all I caught. So I'll have to try to read here or have people um, just ask over it.
I think you can prune out black knot. There are a couple of other folks on here that might have a better answer for me, like for, for Easton in this case. Um, is black knot in prune species treatable? And I believe you can prune that out. Okay, how about the Diplodia versus needle drop? Um, I think the easiest thing with Diplodia is if you're finding it on a tree, you're gonna find it on the cones. And usually the cones, I've, from what I've seen, have been a far easier way to look. And I wish I could go back in my slides, but of course I cannot. There was the disease um, image that I used at the start of that section was Diplodia on a cone. And, they get what looks like a, a crack in the cone. If you can look with a hand lens or maybe even your phone, you can zoom in my phone, it works pretty well. And you can see that that, salt, that small crack is basically clearly a crack and oozing with what, what are, are spores. And that's distinctive from a healthier cone if you have something to compare with. As far as the needle, um, let's see how it was the rest of that question. I lost it. Oh, there. Um, needle drop. Oh, so needle drop. Okay, I see what's happening here. Um, needle drop is going to consistently, so the annual needle drop, I think, is what's being referred to here or asked about. And that's going to happen every year. You're going to see that occur in like let's say um, pea pine as an example, if you look at the annual growth on that, it might have four years of needles. And it would be the oldest year, likely the fourth or potentially third year, or even fifth year, depending on where that tree is growing and how healthy it is, that would be falling off. So is that clear? I haven't heard any noise. I'm not sure if I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're doing great, Peter. Okay, uh, good, there, <laughs> there was one question. Uh, Beth Hill wants to know, with the dry conditions continuing into the spring, warmer than normal temperatures and little to no snow cover, should we be watering our urban trees at this point? Good question. Um, at this point, there's, I don't think there's any real point. Once, once we start to get fun, break you could probably start putting down water that would be more valuable I think putting it on right now I suppose you'd be recharging the soil moisture um, I don't know I, I don't think it would hurt it might be a good idea there's an um, Is that so? The green ash contagious to healthy trees. Um, the fungus is always contagious if it's exposed. So, yes, potentially, and varies by circumstance. I did have, if we have time, I want. I wanted to, sh if I can share, I felt like um, after watching the very first presentation of the day, that I did a poor job of this. <laughs> and I was also wondering if there would be people interested in um, taking a peek at the sick tree assistance form that's really intended to uh, help you all deal with issues while you're out in the field. Um, you can use it on your phone to take photos very readily and submit them online without, before you even got back to your vehicle, you're looking at the tree and you have self coverage. Um, or you can answer telephone calls and be able to drop information online. And it's something that um, I would like to try to do is get a better record of what we're seeing when and where. And that's a, a way of doing it. So you can go to this nbinvasives.org site that's right on the on the front of that, um, right away when you run into the site, it should be almost the first thing you see. No, I can't share. Here we go. 
we can show that if we're if we're not going to run into any questions, we can personally shut my uh, browser. Yep, you can go ahead, Peter, with that. I don't know about you guys, but I always end up with so much stuff open on my. What am I actually sharing? Okay. Are you seeing this? <laughs> uh, we're not seeing anything right now. Oh, no. Maybe I can't share it. Oh, maybe that won't work. Um, well. If you want to uh, send it to either me or Liz, we can post it afterwards for people to see. Well, the, I think the information is all there. So if you were to go to, if you're interested in the sick tree assistance form, which I'm hoping you are, you can go to this NB based software and you'll find it. And it's pretty self-explanatory on there. I tried very hard to word it carefully. So, Thank, thank you very much for your time. It was a little weird watching my own presentation. But I'm glad we got to share it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Peter. We appreciate it. Thanks.